constellations, they're on the galactic equator. At particularly important uh, positions, too, correct? Right. They're at the one radian point. By one radian, uh, think of a circle, and you take the radius of the circle, and you mark it off along the circumference. Mm -hmm. And that angle is uh, equal to one radian. It's about 57.295 degrees. Okay. And so if you take as the center of the circle, like let's say we're looking at the galactic center, and you say that's the a point on the circumference. Right. We're Okay, we're at the center of the circle, and the mm. galactic center is on the circumference. Now you mark off one radian off to the side, and that's where you find uh, Sajita, the tip of the arrow. So this can't be just coincidence. Right, and that's on, that, that's on the... On the relatively speaking, on the north side, if we were looking at, if we were observing the galactic center, is that correct? Right. Okay. And then what's on the south side? The south side you have Centaurus, and the southern cross is right at the southern galactic one radiant point. Hmm. Okay. The little cross, the, the tip of the cross that faces the galactic center is marking that southern one radiant point. And uh, then you'll have the other arrow. So you've got two arrows, really. One is the Sagitta, which is flying outward from the galactic center, and the other is Sagittarius, who's aiming his arrow at mm. the galactic center. Okay. And you get the impression, because it uses this metaphoric uh, symbology to communicate its ideas, and you see what it's illustrating is that this arrow really, uh, well, it's, it's indicating an explosion date, and... Uh, then the, the Sajita arrow is the result of that explosion that flew out, in other words, the cosmic rays. Hmm. One radian would be the distance from the galactic center to us. So instead of talking about angles now, we think of it as a distance. That's marking the distance from the galactic center to Earth. So metaphorically, they're talking about the results of that explosion actually reach the Earth on that date that they're marking. Very interesting. Okay, so... All right, we'll get back to this, uh, the, the importance of this radiant idea in a minute, but l let's get back to the explosions itself and the, and, and, and the core samples. Uh, I guess I want to sort of tie that up because appa right. uh, uh, apparently we have, as an the accepted, uh, yeah, in, in the Antarctic and, and, and in these samples, we have as an accepted fact, a scientific fact that this happens, that these are the results of high-intensity periods of cosmic ray incidents, correct? Right, the beryllium 10 graphs that indicate cosmic ray intensity uh, striking the Earth's atmosphere. And we see peaks, and there's a set of peaks right at that time hmm. when the, the message is indicating something was happening. Uh, and previous times, there's one very large cosmic ray peak around 37,000 years ago, which was the time of the extinction of uh, Neanderthal. And also the time of the rise of of, of the next uh, version. Right, the Cro-Magnon. Uh, well, they supposedly dated back earlier, but they gained more... Of the Dominance or whatever. Dominance, yeah. Right. Yeah, they, 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 for whatever reason, didn't die off. Yeah. And you, you see in the myths, like the, the Hopi and the Mayan myths and so on, and other myths from all over the world, they talk about different ages and different races that existed that became extinct, extinct uh at certain times, and uh, so s this could be, for example, a reference to one of the uh, species that once existed on the planet. Yeah, and they reference different suns in many cases. They talk right. about the fourth sun, the fifth sun, this sort of thing. And when you look at the uh, ice core record, you see that the times of the terminations of ice ages, like not only previous ice age, but the one before that, coincided with these huge peaks of cosmic rays and the beginnings of the ice ages. So we had an interglacial period of something like uh, nine to 11,000 years between those two last ice ages, and suddenly uh, there was another peak of cosmic rays and glaciation began. So these appear to be climatic triggers. Yeah, but not necessarily a trigger for either or. It can be a trigger for uh, maybe, a, maybe a warming cycle or a cooling cycle, apparently. Yeah, and I think part of it has to do with how long the... Uh, superwave lasts. Hmm. So if it's a shorter superwave, more moderate, let's say it might last up from 100 to 1,000 years and be a moderate peak that is able to push cosmic dust into the solar system, that could create conditions that would foster glacial growth. And it would also have to do with the phase of the Earth's precessional cycle. Uh, but then if it was one that lasted longer uh, to the point that the sun began to become active, 
then uh, the sun would heat up and you'd have a glacial uh, recession phase. Mm. So if the ice sheets were already there, they would melt. Uh, so that requires a more extended event. Uh, In other words, it takes longer to push material, et cetera, et cetera, through the solar wind that's, uh, where, where it can actually have a significant effect on our star. Well, it, it, well, it, it pushes it through the uh, solar wind in e either case. Mm -hmm. But it hangs around. If it hangs around long enough, uh, then the sun is going to heat up. It's going to get disturbed. Does it add mass to the sun, Paul? Oh, yeah. Okay. You know, this stuff falls on the sun, and uh, there is a correlation between the rate of matter input to the sun right. and the level of solar flare activity. Hmm. Um, but you wanted to talk about that evidence also in the uh, bird core, right, That um, where they found a spike of acidic material. Uh -huh. And it dated 15,800 years. Well, actually, the original discoverers had dated it around 17,500 years old, but when you do a proper uh, dating of the core, you come up with a more recent date, 15,800 years, which is the date that the zodiac is indicating. That's when the arrow indicator lines up mm. exactly with the heart of the scorpion, right. as the myth uh, talks about. Well, the first thing is that, uh, is that it is an accepted uh, fact. Now, we know that these core explosions happen, or we know that these cosmic ray uh, volleys happen. I guess, I guess it's sort of induction to say that it's the core explosion, but I'm, but I'm sure that you can uh, argue right. that. We, uh, we see it happening in another galaxy. Right, right. So we, we, we see it happening. Quasar, for example, is an example of a very intense explosion mm. of this. Mm. Right, again, a perfectly well-documented cosmic phenomenon that, that, that does this sort of thing. Uh, so we know it happens. Give us an idea of, of, the, uh, of the frequency. It looks like you've looked pretty seriously at the core samples. What do you? I, I think that you have an idea of how many years, plus or minus. Plus or minus for what? Well, what's the frequency of these outbursts? Ah, uh, the large ones occur about every thirteen thousand to twenty-six thousand years. Okay, so Great. there's quite so there's quite a, a large window there. Uh, yeah, to grapple with this problem of frequency, I I developed a magnitude scale like you mm -hmm. have for earthquakes or tornadoes. Uh, so I, I've broken it into four magnitudes. And again, all these are based on uh, samples that were taken from the ice cores, is that correct? To a large extent. To yeah. a large extent, okay. The mag uh, magnitude 1 would be the weakest, magnitude 4 the strongest, and maybe in the future that w could make some changes to the scale. <laughs> right, like the, like the hurricanes we have these days, that they may have to up the scale, you know? Right. And uh, so magnitude 1 would be a super wave that you, you didn't see evidence of it in the uh, beryllium 10 record of the ice core. So it wasn't strong enough to poke its head above the background. Okay. But it was still something that occurs, and we have evidence that there were something like 14 of such events in the last uh, 5,300 years. From looking at the galactic center, you see these puffs of gas that have come out from the galactic center. Okay. Uh, and the last one of these things, sorts occurred 700 years ago, and there have been only a few out of these 14 that have gone longer 700 years. So uh, we may be uh, imminent for another one of these small, at least of the small ones. Then the magnitude two would be larger ones that you actually see them as spikes in the record, but they're not strong enough to make a climatic change. You'd see the cosmic ray peaks, but they'd be so brief that there wasn't a major change like in initiating an ice age or terminating. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but they could cause some temporary climatic uh, blizzards, things like this. There was one like this 5,300 years ago, uh, around the time of the beginning of the Mayan calendar. Then uh, magnitude 3 would be a longer duration superwave, one that would last from a few hundred to a thousand years okay. and be more intense. Uh, maybe it would double the background level of a cosmic ray background. That would be strong enough to initiate an ice age. It would push in enough dust to do that kind of thing. And then magnitude 4 would be even stronger maybe two to four fold above background, mm -hmm. lasts several thousand years, and that would be enough to activate to the, the sun to the point that it would become like a T-Tauri star. A lot of flaring, you would have a coronal mass ejections hitting the Earth, and it would actually warm the climate to the point where you get rapid melting of the ice sheets, continental flooding due to the ice melting, this sort of thing. 
let me ask you a question about the, the, the rapidity of onset of this sort of thing. When the increase in cosmic rays reaches us here at Earth, that means that the exp 